So, you want to build a mega base? Well, you have a massive task ahead of you, friend. But if you have a need to grind, then you have something impressive to show for it at the end. For those who just want a 60 second too long did not watch, I have a link to that in the description. Or, if you just want to see the small man place many pretty blocks with some nice music, I have also linked that below. For the remaining viewers, this video will cover the beginning steps on the path to building a megabase. To illustrate this, I will be bringing you with me as I build my own megabase on my friend group's survival multiplayer server that we started when the 1.18 Caves and Cliffs update released. Here are some gratuitous shots of a few bases, but they are all fantastic. Playing Minecraft with friends can be a great motivator, as well as making your tasks easier while pursuing a megabase. If you can, I encourage you to find a survival multiplayer server with friendly people to play with. Minecraft has many added benefits when playing with others, and that doesn't mean you can't make a mega base alone, but your job will be much easier with help. As you begin your journey to build a megabase, there are four key things that can help get you started. First, finding a scope for your project. Second, planning before starting. Third, prepping your build area. And fourth, starting where you are most passionate. Let's dive into these topics a little more deeply. Do you actually need a megabase? you haven't built a starter base or a small to mid-sized base before, a mega base may not be the project for you. This is only a recommendation, of course, and you can do as your heart desires. I too have a love for picking up and placing many small blocks. That being said, mega bases are incredibly difficult to finish and will take a massive amount of time. I can only quantify my own time spent building my base, which at present is 52 days, Keeping in mind this number is slightly inflated by time AFKing, so subtract a generous 10 days for that, still a hefty 42 days. On top of that, I have recently shifted my build goals to be a little bit larger than what I initially intended, and that also balloons the time I have already spent on this project. All of that aside, feature creep is a big problem, and may be something you are going to face when planning your megabase. It's okay to leave your megabase unfinished if you do begin building one. They are a daunting task for anyone crazy enough to take on the challenge. So take a moment to think about the scope of your project. Feel free to pause the video if you need to. How big are you looking to go? What sorts of materials will you need? You need to clear an area before building, or perhaps you already have a location in mind. Before you build a mega base, you should at least do a little bit of planning. Part of that includes finding a location where you want to build. If you pre-scout a location, then there is a vast amount of natural terrain you can already work with. Take this into mind while planning and look for a location that sparks your interest. The natural wonders of Minecraft may provide you with an idea you would never have thought of otherwise. In my case, the location I decided to build my megabase in was this ocean. However, my planning started much earlier than finding this spot. You can do as much or as little prep as you would like, but I would advise on doing three things before beginning. First, get a sense for your build palette. Keep in mind the difficulty of obtaining the blocks you would like to use, as not all blocks work as building blocks. Secondly, Putting in place rules for the architecture or what the general theme will be is also important in shaping the direction of your base. Will it be one gigantic build or something more segmented like a city? Consider the fact that more segmented builds tend to be easier to build, as large singular structures can very quickly feel overwhelmingly daunting. Having to place a lot of one kind of block can also turn monotonous very quickly whereas more segmentation allows you to focus on completely different builds throughout the whole process. 
If you are up to the task, however, the massive singular builds are certainly a sight to behold. Finally, do test builds. They can really help in this regard. Don't be afraid to hop into a creative world and do some quick 30 minute to 1 hour builds to test things out. Heck, plan it all out even if that's more your style. You can then use mods like Lightmatica to help you build it more easily in survival afterwards. Once our SMP decided we would be starting over for the Caves and Cliffs update, I started working through some of my own ideas for a new base. I knew I wanted to build something larger and more visible than the last base I built, and that I didn't want to do much excavation. At the time, I was also watching Etho, as per usual, and the idea of his Season 7 Hermitcraft base had really intrigued me. Especially after having just built an entire base hidden underground, the idea of exposing every block was really appealing. When planning a mega base, having a handful of core pillars that you are building the base in service of is exceptionally beneficial. In my case, the pillars I started doing some test builds with initially were a base without exterior walls, I don't want to dig, and inside but outside of a desert city, similar in style to Etho's Season 7 base, just uh, more deserty. What I quickly realized with these first iterative tests is that I couldn't really do a base like Etho. I didn't have the skill set to make the inside feel like the outside, or at the very least not with this build theme. On top of that, my scope had also grown too big and I was no longer upholding my initial goals. I did like the build idea still, but I ended up moving on to try another palette of blocks with the intent of designing something that followed the inside but outside theme better. With that in mind, the new three pillars were a base without exterior walls, I still didn't want to dig, and inside but outside. I liked the idea of this build for a storage room, and it did match more closely with my new pillars, but I wasn't convinced I had nailed something I would like to build on a massive scale. I had considered how I could expand it, perhaps add higher cliffs with more buildings or something similar, but I ended up deciding to move on to more tests. With your own builds, this is a good thought experiment to have. How would you continue from where you finished? Doing a drawing or a paint edit can help visualize this too. Feel free to use other art forms to plan out the early or later stages of your builds. It can be a quick way to get visual representation of what you are trying to match. For me, I moved on to more tests and tried a few more palettes, fiddled with some smaller builds, just playing around with some of the new blocks that would come out in 1.18 and seeing how they could be used. Over the course of these tests, I had grown bored and I was at a loss for ideas. So, in true Minecraft fashion, this is when I started playing around with boats. In my case, I was trying to figure out whether or not you could make a stream that continuously cycled boats. I couldn't quite solve the problem, as you can see here. The system does work, but eventually, the boats would drift and they would cease their cycle. Since then, Dingy Fried, the absolute legend, has solved this problem. I've linked his video in the description detailing how to make a lazy river if that interests you. When I couldn't quite solve this problem, however, my focus shifted to minecarts. I had already considered how the boats could be used as a transportation system to get to different parts of the base, and I was hooked on the idea. And thus, a whole new chain of experiments began. I got a pretty good understanding of how terribly minecarts work while doing these experiments. Fortunately, within that jank is a just barely usable transportation mechanic that seemed capable of what I wanted. With these experiments complete, I returned to the idea of a desert city, using the theme as a build palette for a test station. The end result was this cycling minecart system that kind of looked like a subway entrance to what would eventually be the desert city. 
I had found you could also pulse a rail with this circuit, and it would slow the minecart down enough for players to easily enter at stations. Initially in this design, I had also wanted to use this drip leaf bridge, as at the time Mojang allowed them to be placed on any block, but sadly this was changed to only allow drip leaf to be placed on select earthy blocks like dirt and moss, so that this bridge design no longer worked. With this new test, however, I was pretty convinced I had found an idea I liked, and my pillars once again changed. The new three pillars were a minecart railway, a base without exterior walls, and inside but outside. Plus, still no diggy diggy. Experimenting building a main terminal landed me on the idea of having five distinct areas that could be reached by a rail. I hadn't given any thought to what those areas would be at the time, but I really liked the premise, and I've stuck with that decision since. With this main terminal design complete, I felt I was ready for the 1.18 release, and stopped planning so that I could build things for real when our SMP started. Once you have a general idea for your megabase, the next important thing is to determine how you will get your key building materials. Building a starter base or house to store things in during this time can make this process easier. If you need a massive amount of prismarine, a guardian farm may be your first objective past this. Or perhaps you need to get a beacon and do a few crazy mining sessions to get all the necessary deep slate. Whatever resource it is you need lots of, identify how you will get it early on and take steps to make that process easier. You will thank yourself in the long run. In my case, I needed iron and gold to make rails for the minecarts. So, on the first day 1.18 release and we started up our SMP, I geared up the journey through the mountains to find a village. I promptly returned two villagers by boat to our farming cooperative, made an iron farm, and the mining economy has never been the same since. Shortly after that I also built a simple gold farm so that I was prepared to begin building. Prep also involves laying out some of the guidelines and planning you have done, if you weren't doing your previous planning and survival. Use various colors of wool blocks to outline the floor plans of builds, do some initial terraforming, and get blocks in order so you are ready to start your build. The final overarching lesson for getting started when building a megabase is to begin with the area you are most passionate about. Pick things like a unique transportation system your base will have, or a central home you will reside in. Maybe even a market to sell items to your server mates in. Whatever it is, if you are more invested from the get-go, you will find yourself progressing much faster to your goals. With that being said, don't be afraid to take a break from the area you have started to do another section of your megabase. This is a marathon and not a sprint. If you are finding yourself burnt out building something, then switching things up for a bit can help to reinvigorate you and help keep you motivated. Go mining, build farms, explore the world, and take breaks for other aspects of your life as well. Getting experience in many things will all lend themselves to better and more creative builds. You can find inspiration almost anywhere. Now that the preliminary prep work is complete, the only thing left to do is to start building. We started our SMP when 1.18 released, which unfortunately means the start of this segment may be a bit jarring, as Replay Mod was not available to catch the beginning stages. So, once the iron and gold farms were built, I began work on my megabase. I first laid the foundations of the rail network. And this was a pretty straightforward process, as all of the heavy lifting and design work was already done in our previous preparations. So, as such, the infrastructure took shape very quickly, and the first version of the system was up and running in no time. From there, I moved on to building the main terminal. Ever since playing with the boat idea, I had envisioned a cavern as the hub location. I hadn't done any test builds, so all of the design work was being carried out in survival. Not building something twice can save you a lot of time if you have a strong vision for what you would like to create and are a seasoned builder. 
this can, however, create issues down the line for the cohesion of your build if you aren't prepared. Conversely, it can also spark a lot of new ideas as the build progresses over the weeks and months. Be cautious if you take this approach to building your mega base though, as it can derail a project very quickly. With this build, I wanted the exit point for each of the rail lines to have their own distinct feel to them, so they received most of the early detail work. Much of this cavern though, I was focusing a lot more on the general structure and feel rather than the minute details. Sometimes less is more when starting on bigger builds like this. Sticking to a few blocks and getting the general shape and feel of the finished product before doing the detailing can help you land on something you are much happier with. The first exit that I worked on was the exit for the yellow line. This is a pretty simplistic one. It exits into an amethyst geode that has been exposed in the cavern. You can see the layers of the basalt, calcite, and amethyst. And then I used the amethyst clusters of varying uh, stages to make it look like there were buds growing the amethyst inside. Using some candles it was fairly easy to light as well afterwards. Following that, I did some terraforming to connect the amethyst geode to the exit for the green line. When building in general, and especially for mega bases, there will be sections that are a little bit more mundane or rudimentary. This exit to the green line certainly falls into that category. I topped the stone area between the entrance to the blue and the green lines with what feels like a little bit of a mine shaft area. It gets the job done and offers a great overlook, but at the same time, I didn't want players to linger in this area, so I didn't give it the most detail work. For the blue line exit, I wanted to provide a great vantage point to view the whole cavern from, so I stacked it above the entrance to the area, and this gives the player a unique viewpoint that calls back to the view as they first enter the main terminal area below. Learning how to terraform in Minecraft can seem really daunting at first, but in my opinion, it's one of the most freeing forms of building that there is. You don't have to follow rigid structures and patterns the same way as you do in any other type of building. The accidental block placements could even become your greatest asset when doing terraforming, the happy little rock accident that never was. It can add a lot of extra character to the build even. So when doing terraforming, don't think about it too rigidly. Come at it from a little bit of a different angle and try and get something that feels like the flow you are looking for in the terrain. Don't shoot for an exactly accurate style of rocks. That is certainly something you can do, but I would caution against it if you're new to terraforming and building in Minecraft. There's a lot of space to be creative in how you terraform and you can make a completely different build with the same set of blocks and a similar style. Each time you start terraforming, it will always end up in a new unique experience that is very akin to painting. 
So I'd highly recommend that if you haven't done terraforming before, you give it a shot. It may turn out that it might be your favorite style of building. If you do decide to give terraforming a try, there's a few things you can do to help you succeed. First and foremost is setting some constraints. That's both in your choice of blocks and in how you're placing them. Rather than adding your detail blocks randomly, set some rules for how you're going to place them. Decide whether moss blocks can be next to mossy cobblestone, or whether you'll have transitory blocks between some of the dirts from coarse dirt to regular dirt, and so on and so forth. You can get really creative with these rules, and they can all play together to make really unique and interesting patterns in your terraforming. It's really easy to overlay these patterns onto something as well if you've started with a stone or wool or what have you baseline to get the feel and shape for the build right. From that it's kind of like painting by numbers, just following your rules and detailing to make things interesting to look at. Hopefully you can get a feel for this method as we return to this area to detail it later on. The big feature piece for this area that I'm building up towards is a waterfall that'll cascade down in behind the exit to the blue line. This gives a nice little backdrop to the whole scene I think, and also ties together the water that's in the other areas. It gives it a little bit of a reason for existing. Approaching the top of the cave, I did start to do a little bit of detailing. Uh, I was both a little bit tired of just seeing stone and also the top portions of this are going to be a little bit lighter on detail as they're not going to be a focal point for players typically. You'll see the top portions of the cave, but the details you can make out are pretty minimal. This allows the player's imagination to fill in the blanks rather than having to build some extra details that may not really be visible to anybody. Before adding in the water, I also wanted to connect a walkway from the bottom portion up to the base of the waterfall. This passes alongside the exit for the red line and into a little cavern. The details of this will get fleshed out a bit later, but for now, it's good enough to get the job done. This bridge for the minecarts was difficult to get the style of right. I wanted something that felt kind of like the old-fashioned arched wooden railway bridges, but getting that in Minecraft isn't always easy, so it took quite a few iterations to settle on something that I was happy with. Just because a build or a component doesn't look good the first time you complete it doesn't mean you don't have the right idea. Chip away at the build a little longer, try a few more iterations, and perhaps you can land on something that does fit your vision. When working with water in Minecraft, it's always best to start from the bottom and work your way up. Water works a little bit weirdly, and the way it flows can be greatly affected by the layers underneath of it. So especially with waterfalls, having a good layer for the water to drop into makes a world of difference. This also ensures that all your water will be source blocks, unless explicitly intended, and players won't get pushed around weirdly by flowing water as they try and swim through it. With a lot of work done around the blue line exit, I focused my attention towards the red line now, and continued the terraforming over towards it. The cave is still in its basic shape, and I'm still doing a lot of generalized building here, just getting the shape right building up stone, making sure that I have a good feel for everything. This is by far the most simplistic exit out of the five. I didn't really want to do too much extra for this red exit, as fitting everything into this cave area was already a little bit of a challenge, so making a unique area for this one just didn't feel right. It still occupies a unique place in the whole build though, and I think adds a nice little bit of connectivity to the area as you can get both from the exit of the red line to the exit of the blue and the orange from here.
At this point in the build, things were really starting to take shape, so I started to do a little bit of detailing work, just a little taster of the stuff I'd be doing later, and to give myself a little bit of a break from the monotony. The final line to receive work was the orange line, and this area was a little bit separate from the main cave, so I got the chance to do a really unique area with this, and I love how this turned out. I started by adding in a bunch of dirt and mycelium to be the ground floor for a mushroomy area that would occupy a little offshoot to the main cave. I wanted this area to feel a little bit more overgrown, darker, and like a hidden escape. I wanted somebody who stepped into this room to feel like they could take a little seat and step away from whatever it was they were thinking about to just relax for a moment. I built the cave walls up very similarly to how I did in the previous area, barring the exception that I was including a lot more mycelium and dirt in general to make this area feel a little bit more grungy. The central piece to this cavern was a large custom red mushroom, because what mushroom cavern would be complete without a giant mushroom? If you're ever building custom mushrooms of your own, don't forget that you can use the custom underside texture by placing one mushroom block next to another and then breaking it. This texture really helps to sell the fantasy of your giant mushroom and is in line with the mushrooms that generate naturally in the Minecraft world. I wish I could tell you why the next feature I'm about to build made it into this build, but honestly, I just kind of felt like building it, and, and it happened, and I don't know, I think it looks pretty good in the end, but this weird purple scar thing just kind of came about as Minecraft builds sometimes do. I apologize for the overabundance of green particles at this point, but I decided to hide some spore blossoms up higher so that it would feel like there were mushroom spores floating throughout the air. With a lot of the preliminary building done in the area, I built a little bit of a drop down so that the minecarts could go this way when leaving through the orange line. This was also a good time to get some opinions on what I'd been doing, so I invited one of my buddies over to take a look at the build, take a seat, and rate his general feeling on the vibe that I was going for here. In your own Minecraft builds, one of the most beneficial things to improving what you're doing is to get opinions and assistance from other people. Although you may love what you're building, you won't look at it the same way other people do, and getting a fresh set of eyes to take a peek and tell you where they think you may be going wrong or right can make a huge difference in how you develop your builds and as a builder in general. Our conversation assured me that I was at least heading down the right path, so I spent a little bit more time adding some details and then worked on the through cavern to the red line exit before heading on to some other work. next area I started to work on was the green line. At the end of this line I had already done quite a bit of work on the area, and I wanted to fully complete this section. The idea that I went for was a underground sort of subway feel, uh, using deep slate for the walls to make it a little bit darker and gloomier, 
and then some andesite at the bottom to give it a little bit more of a manufactured feel with the polished andesite and then the regular andesite underneath for sort of this gravelly loose stone um, texture underneath the rails. I did look up reference images while working on this area, but in the end I just tried to fit uh, the Minecraft aesthetic into what I was picturing a subway as, as the references didn't really help me land on anything that I could use directly in this build. Reference images are great, but they'll only get you so far, and if you want to add the little extra details in Minecraft, you'll have to be a little bit creative with how you do things. For this build, I used lightning rods to signify some of the smaller diameter pipes in this area, and I think that's one of the ways in which you can get a little bit creative with some of the blocks in ways you might not have originally used them. Uh, the lightning rods and iron fences and other similarly thin objects can be used for some really unique sections to your builds if you're looking out for those moments, assuming it fits aesthetically, of course. I also finished off the back section of this line to make this entire rail section complete. After completing the green line, I figured it was a pretty good time to take a break from some of this more serious building for something a little bit more lighthearted and fun. Many avid viewers of Hermitcraft will already know about the Dolphin Highway. I built one of those for myself here to connect to a number of my server mates' bases. However, I didn't want to construct one going out another direction to connect to another buddy's base. Instead of that, I decided to build a new creation, which I have dubbed the Dolphin Railgun. This revolutionary new transportation method combines the speed of the Dolphin Highway with the unparalleled power of the Trident for launching. The two together mean you can reach almost anywhere in Minecraft extremely quickly, and at only 67 blocks for the barrel with 3 blocks for a launch pad, it's an extremely small build to put together and easy to set up for anybody. The setup I found works best is to have 31 blocks to build up speed and then 39 blocks to charge your trident at the end. If you get it just right, you can easily launch hundreds of blocks into the air almost instantaneously. It will take a bit of practice to find the right angle and charge and release times, but once you have that down pat, you'll be regularly flying out of the railgun at blistering speeds. I find charging the trident while looking 5 degrees downwards and then releasing at a perpendicular angle to the railgun gives the highest speed when exiting the barrel, and then looking up to 30 degrees gives you the greatest lift. With the railgun complete, it was now time to start in the lobby that connects to it and the main cave. As this is the entrance for everybody to come in, I wanted it to feel like a foyer to a big corporate place, or a rich person's estate, or something to that effect. To achieve that effect, I added in a desk for a secretary, added in some nice little uh, potted plants, and some paintings on the wall, uh, using the white concrete the walls as well allowed it to have a really stark contrast with the floor and not detract from the buttons for the rail system as well as the stairway going up into the main base itself. 
In general, this was meant to be a transitory place, and I think it does nail a little bit of the liminal space feel that I was going for with this foyer. Speaking of the stairway going into the main cave area, I needed to do a little bit of resource gathering for this section of the build. With the main foyer complete and the stairwell now built up to the main terminal, it was time to return and do some of the detail work that we'd left unfinished in the previous areas. For this section next to the red line exit, I decided to make it into a small emerald cave. Having the mini blocks from the Vanilla Tweaks Wandering Villagers does help when adding some details to builds like this. But I also added in some glass panes as well to add some sort of translucent emerald looking bits to this cave for some extra detail. Continuing on from there, I expanded on some of the detail work that had already been done on the area outside the red line exit. I just stuck with what had already been done in this area, there's not anything too unique or special to go over here. I did start experimenting a little bit with some of the raw ore blocks in this area, as I hadn't gotten a chance to use them much before these builds. I really like some of the textures that they've added into the game with these. They can make some kind of unique and interesting things outside of using them as ore blocks, but they certainly fit this build when using them as intended. At this point I had finally iterated on the minecart system enough that it was stable and in a place where I could hook up all the lines and feel comfortable about continuously running the minecarts without causing major issues. There were quite a few issues that did creep up from my initial designs such as minecarts getting eaten, not having chunk loaders in the area to keep things running, and a number of other weird unintended consequences of trying to keep minecarts continuously looping. It took a ton of iteration, but in the end I am super happy with how this system turned out. It's a really unique way to reach different places in the base, and I think adds a ton of movement and life to the whole build in general. I've added in the little areas where you can sometimes see the minecarts going, and it does feel really cool to walk around a corner and just see some minecarts doing their thing as you're going about your business. I stole a mushroom design from Tango of the Tech Variety. He stuck some turtle eggs on top of an end rod and I thought it looked quite good so I included that in this mushroom area. And I also did some iterations on that using candles as well which I think turned out pretty cool looking.
Aside from the large purple scar, the cave walls in this area follow a pretty similar style to the rest of this build. I did try and include a little bit more diorite in this area to break things up a bit more, and I also did include more vegetation towards the top of this section as well, as I felt like this whole area should feel a little bit more overgrown than the rest of it. But otherwise it still follows a lot of the same build patterns and styles we've been doing throughout this section. I made sure to include a good variety of ores in this section as well. As there's so much vertical space, I wanted to make sure that there was enough eye candy to keep the player interested when looking upwards and not get too bored of one singular type of ore just dotted around the entire area. You may also notice at this point that I'm spending a lot of time as well coming in and adding stairs and slabs to add little nooks and crannies for your eye to catch as you look around. You can spend as much or as little time doing this as you want. It will add quite a bit of depth to your builds if you're going in and doing these minute details, but you can also sink way too much time into something like this and add details that honestly aren't going to be noticed by most people. So if you're doing this on your own, try and strike a little bit of a balance. Don't spend all your time adding these details, buttons, and little corners and things. Less is more, and the player's imagination can carry a lot of what you're trying to convey with just a few simple tweaks and adjustments with the blocks to get the right flow. I apologize in advance for how jarring the minecarts will be in these next few scenes. I did want to leave the system on to prove that it functioned and continuously looped without issues, but once it's sped up, it uh, becomes a little bit difficult to look at for an extended period of time, so my apologies. But hey, they work flawlessly, so there is that. the back section of the cave now addressed, it was time to finally work on the very ugly stone floor that I'd left for most of this build. There was a little bit of grass in there to give some visual detail, but this really has been bothering me for a while and it was quite cathartic to finally be able to go through and add some details and flesh out the floor to make this whole area quite honestly come to life in my mind. The extra details that this adds really lends itself to better cohesion with every area in the build and I think I think this detail was sorely lacking and made viewing the whole thing generally worse off as it felt very unfinished and unclean, quite boring to look at with a lot of grey, but the additional details in the floor really just took everything to a whole new level. last section that really needed work in this main terminal was this back wall near the blue line exit. And in general, I still kept things pretty similar, but I tried to include a little bit more of a mossy uh, cobblestone feel near the water here, as well as adding some interesting details with um, walls and things in the little nooks and crannies leading up the wall to give it some more visual interest. Thank you. 
Over the course of this build, my thinking had shifted and I had gone from wanting this base to be purely traversable via rail, requiring you to ride a minecart to get to the different sections of the base, to then deciding that it would be kind of neat to have it both be walkable, but also traversable by horses or pigs as well if people would like to do that. So to service this need, I ended up making a barn off the main terminal here, connected to a cave that will one day link up with the end of the green line as well. It's by no means the most stunning build I've ever completed, but I think it fits the area well, and also has a nice uh, homey, earthy feel to it. I made sure to use uh, prismarine along with some copper and other blocks as well to get a little bit more of a rustic feel. One other consideration I made with this build as well was that I made sure to press F3 and G to check the chunk boundaries and I tried to include this in an area where none of the animals would be crossing chunk boundaries as sometimes you can get a bug where they will just straight up despawn um, just because they happen to be in a chunk boundary when it's loaded or you leave the area. So watch out for that yourself if you are building a barn or an area to store um, some NPCs or animals in it. Um, if you include it in the middle of a chunk, you'll be a lot less likely to lose your things over time. The very last thing that I ended up working on was this small section of cave. I didn't do too much work on this, I just wanted to make sure that things felt like they were part of the world and a little more closed off from the main terminal. It doesn't look like there's a huge incomplete section uh, out there, and as well if you go to get a horse from the barn, it feels like it is a location you're intended to be in still. With that, I'd say we've officially gotten started on this megabase. So, let's take a minute and throw on some shaders to take a look at the completed build for this episode.
Thank you for tuning into the first episode of So You Want to Build a Megabase. I hope that I can also bring you the remaining episodes in this series, but as I highlighted at the beginning of this, a megabase is an exceptionally difficult task to complete, and it's one I'm still working on at this moment. You may have seen some of the progress I've done in the background, so rest assured there is a ton of work that has been going on and will continue to go on, but I can't say when the next video will arrive. Until then, hopefully you can work on your own megabases now and perhaps send me some progress reports. I'd love to see what you're working on and give you some advice or tips and uh, feedback if that's something you're looking for. So please feel free to send me your megabases. Thank you very much for tuning in, and I'll see you next time.